Hi guys and welcome back to another video. I am so happy to have my husband back again for hey a Q&A and I was going to say church chat because we we're going to do a separate video on church stuff but a lot of you guys actually asked questions um, either on Instagram or on my community tab on YouTube when we were talking about doing this Q&A so we thought we would just kind of wrap it all up into one video since again a lot of those questions did pertain to just church things and Sunday school and everything in between. But I hope you guys enjoyed today's video. And with all that being said, let's go ahead and get started. Question number one. Yeah. Question number one. <laughs> Take two. How do you take two? Yeah, this is take two. Well, we might put some reruns anyway. <laughs> take two. How do you stay calm with defiant children? That was a question posed by a viewer on either Instagram or YouTube. Yes. I'll let you answer this one first. Since this is our second take and you answered it kind of first last time um, and had some different insight on it. So. <laughs> so in my childhood, defiance was practiced pretty regularly <laughs> by my definition. I mean... It wasn't really defiance, I suppose. I remember just little things being told to do them and just not doing them because either A, I thought I could put it off. I was a procrastinator. Try not to be a procrastinator as an adult. But anyways, procrastination probably have come off as defiance in my house because we as children are always procrastinating when mother asks us to do pretty much anything. I don't know, I have some thoughts on why as parenting, but I just know we did did it. My mother would get upset. I think part of the problem is she would never stick to her consequences. She would give us these ridiculous consequences, like you're never leaving the house ever again. She did the best she could. We were acting like complete sanity sometimes. Not always, we were pretty decent children. When she would leave us on our own, I was older by this time, so I was watching some of the younger children and we were given a list of things that we were supposed to do and a lot of times these things did not get done mm -hmm. and i will be the first to admit that i was probably a culprit for <laughs> procrastinating on doing them so i guess that all that to stay to say my mother handled defiance same response almost every time she would just give us the consequences and be very upset and stressed out obviously and then these consequences would slowly fade out like she wouldn't really keep them like she couldn't they were very extreme I think they were just to like make a statement that I'm upset with you and they did we got we got that point we knew she was upset uh, as for our house our children I think we don't really have too much defiance every now and then I will classify somebody in our house as being defiant but usually it's they forget uh, maybe I'm just being nicer because my kids but <laughs> No, but they just forget. A lot of times we don't have any actual, like, tell them to do something and they just don't do it. Maybe every now and then, once or twice with one or two of them, I've seen it a little bit. But usually it's because they forget. But it's still frustrating even when they do. And it's hard to stay calm even when they forget. Well, it's one of those things where if they're involved, especially in our evening routines, like they're involved in some really, like, heavy play. Because that's like they're pretty much from, like, 7 to 8 is their time where they yeah. just, like want to play so hard before bed and that's normally the time that <laughs> we'll remind them to brush your teeth yeah we brush your teeth oh we have, i forgot gotta go do that that requires taking a second to just think about it in your head your response rather than responding uh the second you feel like responding which is usually immediately and that's not always easy to do like yeah a, i've talked about really. creating habits and stuff and that kind of goes along with creating an atmosphere where you're not dealing with the forgetfulness or defiance is creating them like making them into habits instead something well when you mentioned this i'll talk about mine here in a minute but when you mentioned the whole being forgetful and your children doing certain tasks i came across it might have been a blog post or something and they were talking about not just training new habits in children but creating almost like a belief system with your parents so when you're trying to teach a habit you don't just tell them what to do but you do it with them so you spend a week doing it with them like walking alongside them taking their hand let's go do this together second week you say okay let me go with you so you're passing on the responsibility to them a little more and then week three you're like okay i'm going to watch you do it now 
And so you're just going to glance over, make sure to do it. And the fourth time we're like, okay, I'm going to let you go do it. So like every single week you're giving them a little bit more responsibility between, and then by week number six, it's them telling you that they're going to go do it. So I thought that was interesting where you start with week one, you go with your children or you say, you know what, let's go do this together. So it's the parent inviting the child to go work on a new habit. And then it just gets every week until they're the ones going off and doing it. So yeah. I, I like that concept or idea. So sometimes creating new habits and systems can kind of help with defiant children. Um, if you know they're going to not do it, it's doing it with them so they know the importance and value of it, I guess. Yeah. It, it, curves, it curves the defiance anyway. My upbringing was a little bit different when it comes to being defiant. And it's funny because like I am trying to wrap my mind around still how to put everything into words um, when it comes to this whole issue of dealing with defiant children. Not just dealing with them, that's the wrong term, like, but staying calm with them. Yeah. Um, but growing up, it just was not allowed in our house. It was this expectation that we were going to do it. If there were tasks that I'm sure no one loved to do, but it was just one of those things that it was, it. we just kind of did it. And I mean, that sounds good. I mean, it... Yeah, I don't remember. See, my own upbringing, I, I don't remember a core, like, defiant thing. It just wasn't something we did. Anyways, it was up to us whether or not we were going to have a bad day or a good day by either grumbling through it or we could do it happily and just be done and get it over with. Have, like, kitchen lists. One person would be on laundry for the month. One person would be on kitchens for the month. And so it was just... All, we had that. It was the expectation that it would be done, so why grumble? Well, as, a, as, as an adult, I, I get that. And I, but as yeah. a child, I apparently missed that one because we, we grumbled a lot. I remember. But it's just not a, it's just not one of those things that sticks in my brain. Oh, I see. Does so that make sense? You so I'm sure, about that. like, I, I don't have any core memories of grumbling doing chores or grumbling having to do school. Like, I don't, I don't know. So you're, you're more positive memories. More all, positive. All over, when it, positive as far as being told to do something and it was just, that's what... Do. I don't have negative memories. I mean, we were not like that really at all, but I don't remember it negative. I I remember it as it's just different. Amusing. Yeah. Like I remember yeah. thinking to, well now I think to myself, why did my parents put up with that? I mean yeah. in no way I would. Yeah. But it, you know, I'm not there yet either. So Yeah. We were older when this was going on. Yeah. And so I think that's why with the kids, like our own children, taking that into the next generation of when they are told to do something and if they are like having a bad attitude about it then I just remind them it's not going to change anything like you still have to do this task but it's totally up to you whether or not you're going to be miserable doing it or whether or not you want to be happy doing it and they will always choose to snap out of the attitude and do it happily because ultimately they don't like the way they feel when they're old, when they're grumbling either so giving them the choice and the powers in their hand to like they still have to do this task so they might as well be happy because and them sometimes, grumbling and throwing a fit about it doesn't change anything. They still have to do it. So. Okay, sometimes their yeah. mood can, you know, because they're tired. Yes. yes. And I think so that's understanding you're tired a little bit. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Comes into play here. Yeah. Like, I'm sure we were tired growing up sometimes, and I remember yeah. there was grumbling going on. Oh, for sure. And if we made, especially as we get, er, for I was homeschooled, K-12 as well. And then, so when we got into like the later middle, middle school years and high school years, and so it was our choice to stay up late and like read all the books. <laughs> I used to stay up the late reading. I, breakfast time never changed. It was seven o'clock breakfast, eight o'clock devotions. That never changed. So it was up to us then to show up exhausted and tired and kind of grumpy or well rested. That was in our, that, that was our choice. Um, so if we did show up the next day grumpy, it was the reminder of, Hey, <laughs> don't do that the next night. Right. We, um, we, you know, but yeah, yours was a little more tight. Our schedule very for yeah. a lot of time. Well, the only, well, we mostly got a really early growing up uh, because that was our only time to hang out with my dad before he left for work. And okay. so he would do family devotions right at eight o'clock so he could start work. I feel like um, there was seven. multiple parts of my growing up mm -hmm. because when I was younger, I was in school and we had to be out the door by a certain time. So dad would wake me up different early. Seasons. Yeah, this was yeah. different. There's a lot of different seasons, I think, in anybody's life. Yeah. But some lives have much more varying seasons yeah. than others. We got on a rabbit trail a little bit. That's going to so be every question. My answer to staying calm is to just try and put yourself in their shoes. Yeah. Remember when you were their age. Try to remember that you struggled with all the same stuff. And, it, you know, as adults, it's good for you to kind of go back in time. Remember those younger years when you 
because you can all remember it. I mean, you, I can remember back to when I was four or five years old. Mm -hmm. That's about the oldest, the uh, longest time I can remember back to, but it's about the longest you need to remember, coincidentally, too. I think God made it that way. <laughs> you can remember the struggles that you went on as a kid. Try to have some empathy for the younger ones, and that doesn't mean they don't have rules and there's not consequences, but yeah. that does help you respond with respect mm -hmm. and dignity. You want to respond with, to them like you would respond to an adult. Yeah with childlike mannerisms, but yeah. the same patience you would show an adult. Yeah. That's, I guess, my answer. Yeah, same. I think I'd agree with that. And then for me, I think knowing the root behind why they're doing what they're doing. So is this a, I forgot, like you mentioned before, or is this an intentional, I just don't feel like doing it. <laughs> and so yeah. um, then it lets me know, okay, do I just need to extend more grace because they forgot, or do we actually need to go sit down and have a disciplinary like talk? Like yeah, talk right. about what the root issue is because a lot of times with defiance there's 100 percent always a root issue and so unless you find that root to what is causing the defiance it will never get solved because you can tell them the same thing over and over and over again and so it's going to go in one ear and out the other yeah. um so i found really digging into the root of it and they'll tell you honestly if you start digging even like when, when they're younger too yes like when you start asking the questions like what is going on like why did you do this or why did you do that why did you do a why did you do b or why didn't you or why didn't you do yes something. um and then they'll sometimes will have a good answer sometimes they won't and then you have to find the root answer to well why is why are they saying they, they feel like doing it um, yeah, so and that's the, the first answer they give, maybe, I don't know, but you yeah. got to dig a little. Yeah, and so because it's not going to fix anything, especially with defiance, if we don't find the root of it. So that's one thing I would, you know, in the mix of, you know, so, the, with the whole forgetfulness thing to extending grace. And, so um, do some research, do your due diligence, know your yeah. child, get to know your child if you don't know yeah. your child. Nobody knows their child completely, so I guess that's the answer. Do yeah. Know your child. Find out the root of the problem figure it out. There always is one. <laughs> you just it doesn't it, just yeah. have to be a punishment. Now there can be punishments, but they feel For like... Sure. I think a punishments and consequence is a little bit different. Like a punishment is the actual like purposeful defiance is one thing, but then the consequence is you made a bad decision and because of this bad decision we do need to have a consequence. Um, because that also goes into their entire life of when you make bad decisions in life there's always going to be a consequence and that starts at such a young age and planting that truth in their heart mm -hmm. that every single decision you make in life, whether good or bad, will have a consequence. And so teaching them at a very young age, it's always going to be a consequence. I'm really oh. getting that, but. And I, I think just remembering that patience can go along with Oh, so. yes, 100%. Back to it. <laughs> right. Next question. So how you actively stay connected to your spouse with so many children. So actual strategies and mindset. I think scheduling time mm -hmm. to think about it, not even do anything, but to think about it yeah. at the end of every week so you can talk about it, discuss what went well, what went well and what didn't go so well. Mm -hmm. And the key is to actually just think about it because a lot of people just don't, I mean, we were getting to the point where we don't for a while, yeah. just because you get so busy and there's mm -hmm. just always something going on. And some seasons of your life are much busier much than others. Busier. <laughs> so some seasons it's going to be harder than others. But I think the hard seasons are where you're going to get better at it. Mm -hmm. And the easy seasons are just kind of your float through it. But if you do the hard seasons well, the easy seasons are going to be that much better. So. As far as like in the season and the little years, my mindset, it has to switch because if we have, I think for me anyway, in the busyness of the little years and then you're gone a lot. Yeah. And, and so I feel like my mindset has to be that this is not, and we've talked about this on my channel before, but our marriage relationship is not 50-50. A lot of times it's going to be 80-20, 20-80, 90-10. Yeah, depends on every day it varies. And probably. every single day it's going to vary. And so my mindset has, has to make sure it does not go near the what about me type mentality. And it can't be, oh, it's 50-50. Um, that's not the way it works, especially when there's and the busyness of it's never 50 50 ever no just it's like when you have two cups of water if you pour them into two cup, separate cups yeah. or if you have a cup of water you pour it into se two separate cups you're never going to get it 50 50. there's always going to yeah. be some more in one glass than the other yeah. never ever is there one person with the exact same amount of energy as the other person yeah. like, no matter what day it is of the year period especially when things get tough a lot of times it might be more like 20 and 40. Mm -hmm. There is not even a hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> so yes. you gotta remember that. Some days too, yeah. So if you're at, if you're both at a 20, 
that's a combined 40. Mm -hmm. So I like to say you combine them. So you have the tops would be 200, but that's rare. Usually the highest you're ever gonna hit is 175 or maybe 180 yeah. when both people are close to fully having all their energy and mental capability you can possibly have. Uh, but more often than not, I think it's probably less than 100 combined. Yeah, yeah a so, lot of days right now. So, yeah, yeah they're in the busy, especially during the busy child years when you're off doing things. And, yeah. But those are also some of the most memorable years, yeah. and you're going to think back fondly upon them, and you'll miss them. Mm -hmm. So I've been told, yeah. once, you're, once you're older and they're all gone, and now you're living with just your spouse, and you don't know your spouse, and so like that's why you want, don't want to get to that point. You want to yeah. enjoy those busy years, so this way when you get to the years when it slows down a little bit, I think through those seasons, no matter like every single baby that gets added to the family, I think each person changes as well. Yeah. And so you kind of have to get to know each other all over again and connect each other all over again through every single change. Even though like, yes, we're used to being parents, but when you add baby number three and then baby number four, like there's a different level that you get to know each other too. And I think the biggest one for us is like respect is like respect. At least my mindset is respecting yeah. where each other is and at. Understanding. Um, just. Understanding. Yeah, that's a huge one is understanding. I have the mentality as well of this is not just like a husband and wife, but it is a partnership in life. As far as an actual strategy for how to connect in the little years. Well, we were just talking about it. <laughs> if you have, it depends yes. on your connection, you know. Yeah. Maybe you have a lot of people that can help you and take the children. Maybe there's nobody you would trust with period at all. That goes into the next question of um, what we do if or if we do date nights and what that looks like. We can answer that question in this one too. <laughs> yeah, so date nights. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Date nights, when you have littles and you live, you know, this is going to depend on your situation in particular. If you live in the city, date nights are going to look different than if you live in the country. If you live near your, you know, family, uh, people that can babysit, they might mm -hmm. look different than if you you know, just move to an area and you don't know many people. Uh, it also just depends on, I mean, personally, we don't really like leaving our children with too many people. So most of the time our date nights might consist of going out, getting something and bringing it back home. Yeah. Or maybe doing something with the kids. What's it for you? I see, it depends who I allow to sneak into my thoughts and tell me what I should do for date night. Because I also yeah. listen to a lot of different marriage podcasts and family podcasts. And I hear a lot of extremes of people telling you like what to do and like different advice. I hear this couple over here saying, um, like you have to do a date night every single week, get away from your kids and just be a husband and wife. Yeah. And while I agree and I think that's a beautiful thing, that's not really attainable for everyone. That's so hard what to I do. so yes, yeah, so what I hear in my head is of oh no, if we're not leaving the kids and going out on a date every week, or is our marriage gonna be good? Are we gonna keep the spark alive? And things like that. And then you'll even have the same couple say, you need to even do like a week vacation every single year away from the kids. I don't know, like I don't have that desire, I guess. I think it'd be fun. Yeah. But I just don't have that desire to get away. It'd be a good tradition. It'd be a good tradition. And so I, if I allow a lot of those thoughts to come into my mind, then I could easily fall into a, my marriage is not good. We don't do regular date nights. We don't leave the kids really much at all, if at all. And so I could really allow the enemy to sneak in and steal the joy of our marriage, I think, because I could hold it next to someone else and be like, oh, well, they do this every week. They but do this every you year. You might also think that some people can yeah. just sneak out for like an hour and they have a neighbor who lives yes. like across the hall. <laughs> Yeah. who can watch their kids who they trust. Yes. So I don't think there's one answer to fit. Yeah, and so I think that's a good thing to remind myself too when I am <laughs> listening to all the marriage advice as far as people saying like you have to do date nights. I think that's what's the actual, that's what I think the connecting on the, e the every evening basis as well. When you meet parents, or not parents, when you meet a, a married couples that don't have children. Yes. Patience is like, they think they're patient people, but yeah. they're not. Yeah. <laughs> ever. They're patient with adults, but you don't know patience until you have children. But yeah, typically for a date night, I love the idea of them. It's just not something that's attainable. And if they're not attainable and if they're not a, like exactly a regular thing, even though we do, occasionally we'll go on a date night and I feel like whenever we do, well, they they're could be at home too. They do. Well, that's the thing. That's, that's what, where yeah. the little booklet where it gives yes. you date ideas without leaving yeah. your house. 
Yes, yeah, so that's Andy. one of those things where on Sunday night is normally our favorite night when the kiddos will go to sleep a little bit early and then we'll hang out together um, and stuff like that. So we do have date nights at home. Or you I buy think it. I'm referring to like out of the house or stuff like that. But that's what they're referring to. Yes. Yeah. But we could give yeah. our version of a date night. Yeah. That's not the show. Our version, Everybody's I love version, our version. That's our version. Yes, and I love our version because it's not anything fancy. But it's not for everyone. Yeah, it's not. I know a lot of people can't connect unless they probably do leave the house. Correct, yeah. Um, but I, I don't know. I enjoy just kind of hanging out at here. Um, if the kiddos do go to when bed you do, early, when you do do it fairly rarely, <laughs> say when you do it fairly rarely, like don't go out on a date night that often. I'll finish this while she's taking Millie back upstairs one more time. But when you do do this fairly rarely, the date nights where you do go out are much more memorable and they stick with you try to make them more memorable you can spend more money on them you can just i was just saying how you could when you do them very rarely they're more memorable and oh 100 and they're also 100%. you can spend yeah. more money on them and make it more memorable yeah. but even if you don't spend a ton of money they're still more memorable yeah. Um, which is something we don't do that often yeah it's so. not something that we do that often even though like you said it makes it very memorable when we do go out for those handful of times a year on an actual formal date night yeah. And, but you know, with the nurse land and, you, and the baby, I also don't like leaving the babies if they're nursing. Yeah. And so her, she's very yeah. limited as to what she wants to do. Yes. Too. So, um, with nursing. the baby. And, but then when, if they're all old enough to stay at grandma's house and we'll which they are back. now. So. Yes. So we I may see. do this more. So yeah. <laughs> so like they, like everything else, seasons of life. A different season. We will probably sure. have a totally different take on this question. Give us two years. Yes. <laughs> so, but at yeah. different seasons, you just got to remember to give yourself flexibility yeah that's where i think the mindset thing comes in yeah don't don't be grudge that that time because you'll look back upon those times yeah. and remember them fondly yes even if there's yeah. a struggle at the moment i think there's a lot of beauty too and sorry sorry to stay on this question for a while but i think there's a lot of beauty and also recognizing that you can connect in the mundane that you don't need an extravagant date or an extravagant outing in order to either solidify the marriage and things like that because I feel like the people, not that this is for everybody, and I know everybody's different, I'm just talking from my perspective and from what I've seen in their personal lives and stuff is the people that do go out on regular date nights, they start to get bored of like, well, going out regularly, so then they try to find something else to do. Yeah. And so I feel like contentment really is a key for a happy and thriving anything. Yeah, like I think contentment really is a key for thriving in anything in life, um, whether it be marriage, children because um, yeah. really if you take away contentment you're never going to be happy doing anything <laughs> you can have the most extravagant date night and not be happy if you're not yeah, content you can have the most extravagant house the most yeah. extravagant car but if you're not yeah. content then yeah. there's always somebody that's going to have nicer this or doing yeah. something differently that way yeah. i guess the whole the answer to the date night is just to be content with what works for you in your situation and season. and season of life and enjoy what's going on yeah. Uh, so if you can go out, awesome. If you can't, awesome. Just make it fun mm -hmm. either way. But yeah. yeah. Okay. Want to read the next one? Sure. Okay. Okay. This kind of goes along with what we were talking about at the beginning. Okay. Uh, but what elements from your husband's upbringing and your own were the most meaningful for you to carry on and how you raise your children? So things that I look fondly upon my upbringing and I want to redo. Yeah. Uh, well, we'll start with my mother. I always appreciated that I could always hop in her room and sit next to her and she was always open to talking or hearing anything I had to say pretty much. So that's something that I appreciated from my mother. And I spent many hours just sitting on her bed chatting with her. And my dad, well, he passed on a lot of things like things that he's good at, like construction and carpentry. And he would help me build tree forts and do just anything really we wanted to do. He was pretty flexible. Mm -hmm. He was busy, he worked, you know, he was a self-employed dad, so he wasn't around a ton. But when he was around, I do have a lot of fond memories. Mm -hmm. He was a very, uh, if it was house related or building related, construction related, that was his language, his love language, I guess you would say still is actually. Because a lot of your talents and stuff came from. Yeah, yeah not necessarily construction, but just talents and mm -hmm. time spent and uh, having an open yeah. door policy yes. for the children to, yes. with, to bring their questions. How to do everything in life, honestly, yeah. like the life skills. Life skills, yeah. yeah. That's important. What about you? I think the most thing that impacted me as a child, and I don't think you realize the impact of it until you become a married spouse with children, then you start to realize how impactful it was. But I think the 
thing that I appreciate the most and that I try to be intentional with making sure my children see is it a positive interaction between us because I only really ever saw positive interactions with my parents and so the sense of security that that provided me as a child I want to get that to my kids so I feel like yeah. one of the number one things when it comes to parenting and providing that really nice atmosphere for your kids home is our relationship so that's yeah. when it goes to our talk about connecting and date nights and keeping our relationship priority yeah. really affects the children as I, well. I, I couldn't and, agree more. Yes. And so that's my number one priority and the number one takeaway. Like even as a child, I could pick all these different things. That's the number one thing that I try to be. And so another thing that I really appreciate that my mom did particularly was to not speak a negative word about her husband to anybody growing up. And so I kind of carried on that. And just because I think you have to speak life into relationships as well. And if you are choosing not to speak life into it, I also believe the negative can take effect to where you're almost cursing that thing. Yeah. Um, Cause words are so powerful. And so I wanted like, that's for the kids to see. It's a really if you get used thing. to bad yeah. molding your spouse yes. around other people, yeah. then you're going to end up doing it to them and to their face in one and way it's, or it's another. And it's bad, and it's also like that's not speaking life into them at all. Uh -huh. And so that's one of the most impactful things. Even though, yes, they did things with me or for me as a child, it really, like, the most impactful thing had nothing to do with what they did for the kids in general. <laughs> it was really just how they treated each other. And yeah. again, the sense of security, because you never had to doubt for a moment that your home is not going to be intact or it just so much security. And so yeah. I wanted to give that to the kids. To and I, I feel like that's contagious too. If you do yes. that around other people, yeah. they will find, do the same thing. Yes. Like yeah. you could talk negatively about your spouse and then that's going to continue yeah. negative lingo amongst whoever you're chatting yeah. with. It's going to, it's, it's contagious as well. Yeah. Negativity is always contagious yeah. in pretty much any conversation. <laughs> But so is positivity. So if you start out a conversation and or even change a conversation, yeah. so somebody's maybe complaining about their spouse for this, that, the other reason, mm -hmm. and then you're like positively readjusting the conversation to swing it back to what maybe yeah. more positively, then you'll notice that that person will mm -hmm. swing it towards a positive direction as well. Mm -hmm. And so you're becoming a good influence, I guess. Yeah, I think that's the most important thing. And I feel like... The health of a home is solely, honestly, reliant on the parent's relationship. Yeah. Um, as far as, honestly, just the temperature of the home and the peace and... Yeah, you can tell if you, you walk into a house where the parents <laughs> yes. fight a lot. We had yeah, a couple... It's heavy. Yeah. I had a couple friends who bickered a lot, mm -hmm. shall we say. Or I had a friend and his wife used to bicker a lot. You know, it was a tenser house. We used to think they did it just for fun, but, I, you know, I don't think you can bicker for fun. I've come to the... Yeah realization that there's no such thing as that yeah second part of this question would was directed for you is how would or what advice would you give for a husband wanting to lead his family well i know what i would say in this but i'm gonna <laughs> let you talk about this first i kind of know what she would say too uh i would say this is something where i grew up in a home where this mm -hmm. wasn't a strong point, we'll just say. And it wasn't necessarily what you think. It wasn't that my dad was a bad leader. It wasn't that, really. We'll just say that leadership was a struggle. And it did strain, like, our situation as a family. Uh, like, we, I have, like I said, plenty of positive memories. So, for me, this is, like, changing. Like, this is not going from my background. This is a first-generation like change because my dad's dad w was family was kind of like that and my mom's m mom's family was definitely a mess so this was uh, breaking a tra tradition or a trend or whatever you want to call it a generation change. change yeah breaking a generation so i would say you gotta it's hard too especially because a lot of people are going to ask this question grew up with it not probably being mm -hmm. a good thing in their house like there was no leadership or there wasn't a good situation mm -hmm. yeah or there's like a boss man who just basically runs rules the house like a uh, like he's the master of his ship yes. the master of his ship you know it comes close to that uh, so I think there's a good middle ground to take mm -hmm. and I think you have to remember that just because this is how you grew up you have to remind yourself what you're trying to do is a good thing. And because I feel like there's always that little voice that's somewhere down there that mm -hmm. says, 
you, you can't do that. Mm. Why would you mm. do that? So uh, just to think it over. I think for you, and you do a really good job on this too, is this is something that I saw growing up too, and it wasn't that like, when it comes to leadership, I think especially for your style, it's not so much as what you tell the kids or even what you like are saying with your words, it's really in how you're acting. And yeah. I feel like actions do speak louder than words at the end of the day, and so when they see you either treat me with respect, you're listening to me, you're speaking kindly to them, you're patient with them, yeah. um, you are seeking the Lord, you're leading us in prayer, um, they see you opening yeah. the Bible, that is going to speak more than anything you could ever say. So I think when it comes to leading spiritually in your home, you really kind of lead by like example. I, I, I think you do a good job in that. I feel like you're going to have good nights and you're going to have yeah. good days and you're going to have bad nights and bad yeah. days. Yeah, <laughs> everybody. And I think you have to accept that and yeah. just roll with it. And when mm -hmm. things don't go, when you're sitting in bed at night, you're thinking that didn't go well. Yeah. Then, or maybe it did, mm -hmm. but you got to remember tomorrow's a new day and yeah. you got to, learn from your mistakes and yeah. learn from your wins too. Maybe you could even improve those. So, yeah. I'm going to speak on this lightly too when it comes to husbands being a leader and this is more of a thing for wives. And I think a lot of the problem with either men not stepping up and leading or wanting to be a leader is because we're not loving them. <laughs> and so, yeah. you know, I feel like that's a big thing in our culture nowadays is the women don't want to be led. We don't want to be told what to do. We don't want to be told how to think and not that you have to be told what to think and do. But there also has to be a mutual respect of like, if he is making a decision for the family, are we completely going like crazy and like pushing that away to the point where he's like, well, I'm not even gonna try to leave because every time I do say something or want to direct our family, I'm met with resistance. Hmm. So there's no even like, why would I even try to do this because I'm being met with resistance. So I feel like when it comes to how should your husband lead, a lot of it has to do with the wives. Are and that was that's what kind of happened yeah. growing up. It was very that's why my dad was not. I wouldn't say it's the only reason, but it was, it was, some of it was his upbringing. As he was well, but that was a good part of it that he was probably afraid. I don't know. He I'm not really asked. Him. Well, I think everybody. I think as women, we all have this thing too, where I can find like myself too, and I've like been guilty of this many times before. Yeah. Whereas if you do make a decision for the family, and I just like won't act on board, even though it's from your heart, it's coming from a place of I need to lead the family down this direction, or we need to do this differently, and I might not be on board with it at first. Yeah. And then the next time something comes up and you're like, I need to direct the family this way. And you're like, I'm not going to bring it up because I might be met with resistance. And so a lot of men's leadership, I really does come stem from the support of us. Yeah. Like that's to my perspective anyway, is it's not like, cause a lot of men would probably be great leaders if they had someone backing them. <laughs> I think it's leadership, hard. leadership's tough because yeah. you also have to know what's going to work and what's not going to work. Yeah. Like if you're the captain of a ship and you know, your crew can, do this this and yeah. this realis realistically to expect like three times that yeah. or more or to expect them to do something that you know they can't do or won't yeah. do yeah. that's not the making of a good leader you have right. to to know your your crew yeah, and know sure. what, what yeah. they are up for and not up for and then to kind of put that through your lens and help that make decisions for you yeah so really you're just that goes back to being studying your yeah. your situation how you yeah. can make the best decision that's going to suit everyone you know we could sit down and have a discussion about something and usually i don't make a decision without yeah. that like, i don't yeah. think i ever sit down and say hey we're doing this yeah i, I would agree with that we could talk about that we could talk about <laughs> this subject probably for yeah. a while but yeah. i think the main thing i would say is to study your situation study who you're leading whether it be a, just a spouse or maybe a spouse and some children, n get to know them really well. Mm -hmm. And so before you tell them what to do or before you attempt to lead by just direction, know the know the people you're you're dealing with and loving. So what type of denomination slash church do we go to? Well, I was Catholic. You grew up Catholic. So yeah, I, I grew up Catholic. Mm -hmm. uh, we switched to a... A United, no, not United, an, an, an evangelical Methodist mm -hmm. church uh, when I was probably like seven or eight, mm -hmm. maybe right nine. Back to the beginning. Yeah, yeah back to the beginning. Mm -hmm. And so, and then we went there, I don't know, like quite a while, probably eight or nine years. And then we went to a Baptist church mm -hmm. and 
now that that's before we were I met my wife mm -hmm. uh, since then I think I guess we've been mostly non 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 denominational, non -denominational. Yeah. most of the churches we've gone to have either been Baptist or non denominational yeah and even the Baptist ones like you wouldn't know they're like they don't like it's not like Southern Baptist or it's not like such and such Baptist church they were Baptist if you look yeah. dug through their archives their theology is. yeah their theology but they didn't like I wouldn't say they were overly promoting the Baptist. I don't even really know, like, I mean, they baptized. There's different extremes. I had a lot of experience because I grew up pretty much all, like, well, I think, yeah, for mostly Baptist churches. Yeah. But we went to a lot of different Baptist churches. Yeah. Anywhere from, like, the small, tiny home Baptist church to the huge church so to... You, so you had a lot more history To the extreme, strict Baptist churches. Um, and so I have a lot of experience a lot of different experiences. She does. <laughs> Probably a little too much. A little too much. And so, and this kind of go, goes into like our talking about like church and our church kind of past, but then going into what church looks like for us now yeah. and like when it comes to raising our kids. And I think a lot of like your decisions when it comes to church and mine come from two totally different areas. So when we got married and we were looking for a new home, home church, because he was originally from uh, New Hampshire. Midwestern yeah. girl. So it was difficult finding a church that we both really enjoyed because you were used to the small Baptist church. But you were too, but you didn't and like I, it. And yes, and so I did not like it because the small Baptist churches that I went to growing up were extremely strict. It's interesting. And so that kind of like turned me off from like the small Baptist church. And so that that's all he was used to. And so when we've got married. But the correct I, I wasn't used to the church hurt. We were just yes. used to it. It wasn't really a small one. Yeah. I mean, it was small by her standards, but out in New England, what we were going to was a pretty good size yeah. church. Cause yeah. The churches are just smaller in mm -hmm. New England. There's less people going to church overall. Yeah. So the people that are there are very genuine. Yeah. For the most part, yeah. I think. yeah. Otherwise, they wouldn't go. Yeah, I think there's a, a good thing and a bad thing. Now, being from the Midwest, where there's churches on every corner, there, yeah, are that can be a good thing, literally. bad thing too. Like, because a lot of times people can be really picky with what they're wanting, and again, that can be a good thing and a bad thing. But the thing is, if if there's one little tiny thing you don't like about church, you're like, oh, let's hop over to this one. <laughs> yeah, literally. <laughs> And you don't have... New England, if you don't yeah. like that church, well, There's you could go to one options. like 40 yeah. miles away, maybe, yeah. and it might be different. There's pros and cons to both. Yeah. For sure. And I think being careful, too, within the church realm of not leaving the church because of just something simple or something little. I know growing up, when we leave churches, it was my parents either protecting us kids from negative influences, yeah. which were crazy even in really conservative churches so yeah. all those little church moves it was to protect ultimately the children like the kids mm -hmm. um, from those bad influences um, that unfortunately are even in churches and then it's difficult because as a parent you always want what's best for your children so as a parent now I can look back and think this is what was best for yeah. sure um, but then the negative impact that that has when you leave a church because you can't tell the church members oh we're leaving because of the bad influence <laughs> you can't you know and so you're stuck with them it's, how, did, how did your parents select churches in the first place they always looked online for the doctrine core belief or we would know someone that went to a church we honestly visited a lot of different churches like we went to a lot of so you're talking churches. more recently back then they haven't i'm talking it. like back then like now if you want to visit a, a church you can okay, do it virtually yeah. just go on a facebook and watch their lives yeah. um and that's sure. a great Thing about church honey now is you can really listen to the sermons, get a feel for what they're speaking about, if they're biblically based. A lot of churches, unfortunately, are no longer biblically based, I feel like. And so that's a good way to really um, look into the into sure. the church, like do your due diligence. Sermon. So it's easier for you, in other words. But it's still hard because you don't you you won't get to know the people unless you obviously go. Yeah. And it's just I don't it can be it can be a stressful thing to church hunt. Um, so when we got married, we went to that tiny little uh, church, which yes. I did not like because it reminded like it. me of all the little it. churches I went to growing up then. Yes. Yeah. They were pretty... Well, let me actually, when we first got married, nice. let me rewind a little couple months because I was going to the, a huge, I would consider it, I would consider it probably a, maybe a mega church. Mm, pretty close. Uh, pretty yeah. close to it. It had like five 
thousand members, I think, um, when we got married. Yeah. And then you were still used to the little church. So when I went from the huge church back to the little yeah. one, I was like, whoa, where, <laughs> where am I? Very. <laughs> Culture shock. The culture yeah. shock for sure. Yeah. And I visited her church on a few occasions. And it was a huge culture and shock. It was for very him. Uh, different, I'll just yes. say. Yeah. There was like it was more like attending a con a c concert. Yeah. Yes. Say conference, but yeah. a mix of a conference and a concert combined. Yes. And I love the preacher, and he always spoke from a biblical based perspective, and every yeah. single one of his messages were convicting. I wasn't a huge fan of the music. Um, well, no, back then you I were, was. Back, back then, then I was. Yeah, you Actually, were. you're right. You were. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> My how times have changed. <laughs> yes. You were a very huge fan. Yeah. I was. Yeah, I, I adapted. About that. I was I a adapted. huge fan, fan of contemporary a, Christian. I like to think I'm a little adaptable. I adapt to you do. most things fairly well. I guess, like, I, guess. I just with the little churches. I always associate little churches with the harshest people I've met in childhood, and so yeah. I had a hard time with. Um, yeah. Little churches vary a lot. Like, they do. Because there's, yes. you know, it's just anybody, yeah. it's almost like creating a website nowadays. Anybody can do it. Doesn't mean it's a good website or a bad website. It's super easy to do. And just because you have a website doesn't mean it's good right. or bad. The church, a little church is easy to create. You know, it's not a lot of, yeah. but it's not like a big church. So for denomination, we're not necessarily looking for a specific like nitpicky denomination. Most of the churches that we have gone to are non-denominational. The one that we're going to right now is non-denominational. I really look for is it biblical, is it biblically based as far as what yeah. they're preaching. Because um, the church, just to you know rewind here a little bit, so the past couple churches we have gone to were just very shallow and I feel like there wasn't even a lot of scripture being spoken and it was a lot of like the same the same type of message you hear week after week. And there was no challenges. Yeah. I felt like there was no convicting of the Holy Spirit. It was all very just more like like surface a, level. A group get together. Yes. Which and it was isn't necessarily bad, but No. No. And I just got tired of like the shallowness and I got tired of the Feeling like again, you were at a concert, and I, I think this is a, a different like as we mature and grow. At least my perspective has changed a lot in that one particular thing. Um, a lot of things, I think. A you, lot we've of all things. changed. Yes, and so now it's like I'm looking for strictly a church that is going to be very biblically based. That is not just going to preach messages that we want to hear, but that we need to hear. Yeah. And that was important to me um, when it came to looking for even a new home church was. Can we even find a church that they're going to speak to us biblically and not give us this watered down version of the gospel? Yeah. And tell us things that we that might make us feel good because sometimes in order for the Holy Spirit to convict us, we don't feel good. <laughs> and so yeah. sometimes you're not going to grow if you don't hear, you know, yeah. something that's going to help you grow. It's and like It's just I felt can... like we spent what 5 or 6 years just in these a little bit more of a shallow type thing. And it doesn't mean that the people are not kind. We met some wonderful people. Um, it's just I feel like it's, they, every they could be shallow, but there's people. Every church has like an inner core of yeah. like things they expect from yeah. everybody that goes regularly. Yeah, and they don't like come out and say it, but you yeah. can just kind of tell. Okay, well, moving on. Why don't we do homeschool? Oh, that was supposed to be Sunday school. I was say we do Sorry. do homeschool. <laughs> we do do homeschool. So if that stays in, we do do homeschool. I don't want to yeah. clarify. <laughs> Why don't we do? Uh, Sunday school. That's a good question. Well, today we couldn't because yeah. our church was vandalized, so there was no Sunday yeah, school. Yeah, our church had to break sadly. it on Friday. Yeah. So, uh, but why don't we do Sunday school? Because now everybody's going to have their own thoughts on this, yeah. but I'm going to go with my thought to start with here. Mm -hmm. Or um, I guess I'm answering my own question. I should... No, you go for it. You sure? Yep. You're I did read the question, no, so. Okay. Well, I would say because. Homeschool, or I keep saying homeschool. Sunday school, <laughs> homeschool is Same totally thing, different. Same thing, honestly. Uh, well, we do, us. but we do homeschool. We don't do Sunday school for the most part. So Sunday school varies from church to church a lot. But in, in my opinion, it's just a, a glorified daycare mm -hmm. where they feed your child, water them, and send them out to grow. <laughs> this and is only our personal experience. This is, yeah, because yeah, like I said, they all vary a lot. Some yeah. churches may have an excellent Sunday school. And even then, the, if they did have an excellent Sunday school, I would still say we probably wouldn't send them there right. because we really want our children to be with us. 
in their little years, not somebody else. If they're with somebody else, that means they're not with us. And we also want them to be in church and get used to the environment of being in a church. Even if they can't understand everything that's going on, they're getting used to hearing preaching versus watching little videos and reading little booklets that, you know, we try to do from our own home. Like we, we bring it to their level at home. I feel like that's our job when we're at home to raise our children, to, to bring it down to their level, teach them the, the little stories in their language. But when they come to church, it's, it's our, their job to get used to the environment of church, sitting down, being quiet, respectful, and... Worshiping with the actual body of Christ, which correct. is not age segregated. <laughs> yes, worshiping with a bunch of different ages, not just their own age. Mm -hmm. uh, it helps to broaden them, mm -hmm. and I mean, we've had good luck. I wouldn't say good luck, but we've had a good experience doing mm -hmm. it. It's a little rough. I'm not going to say it's always easy. because Training them to sit through a service, yes. Yes, but they do do it. We have a 8-year-old and a 6-year-old who are just as quiet as any adult for the most part and mm -hmm. and just as respectful during yeah. church as any adult yeah. probably even more respectful than some adults because <laughs> the guy you know people are on their phone a lot in church they don't always yeah. they're not always paying attention to what's going on yeah. they're just there just check it off the box i feel like so, so what do you think <laughs> um <laughs> recut cut she can't do it with a straight face I know. What do you Whenever think? We have to rewind. We're doing and this do it again. More than once. Yes. We get a lot more so I agree with you pretty much on every right. basis um, when it comes to Sunday school as far as keeping the kids with us. Yeah. The most important thing for me is wanting them to, again, not be age segregated, but seeing what the body of Christ actually looks like. I don't want their first experience of seeing what church is and the beauty of um, worshiping with old people, young people, all the ages yeah. when they get to high school and they graduate from youth group or whatever. Like, I don't want that to be their first church experience. <sighs> and then with all the research and stuff I've done, it's honestly one of those things too where Mm, you know, with youth and kids leaving the church at rapid Yeah, at I was going to get there too. Yes. That's why is, churches are shrinking. Yes, because like they go, they spend, you know, K through 12 being entertained and then they're expected to suddenly enjoy going to church. Mm. Hi, honey. Yeah, so I think it's really valuable to get the kids to sit in the service as soon as possible. That's going to... In my experience, really look at church as a reverence, like they are um, serving a my like serving a wonderful God. They're worshiping together as a community. They look at church as this is a place of reverence for God. This is yeah. not a place where we're going to come and like get entertained for an hour. Having them in the service now and asking them, you know, what they've learned, or even they'll start conversations on or ask us questions about what they've learned. Or they they pick up. They pick up funny things like yeah, things stuff that you we wouldn't might not expect. Even pick yeah, up. yeah. And so they are listening. They are, yeah. And they are paying attention. Even if they're coloring, they're yeah. listening, which is kind of yes. And I just love having them worship in the body of believers with us. I think it's very valuable and it's very beautiful. And I don't know, I even though it's difficult, especially to have like the toddler and baby in service and I'm like out the back in the hallway for a lot of the time, you have to start somewhere when it comes to training. And even Maddie, she's three, um, almost three and a half, and she sat through most of the service today. Yeah, she was pretty yeah. quiet too. Yeah, she did a really good job. She today. even sat by herself for a while. Yeah. <laughs> and so that And she will too. sit too. Like, yeah. She, I don't know if this has to do with anything, but if I do it, if I take them, they're a little more quiet than if yes. mom has them. Then if mommy has them. Yeah, them, it's because mo mommy's used out. to play time and <laughs> yeah. school and I, they're yeah. more, I yeah. don't know, they just, yes. like Maddie will sit in my lap Yeah. more so than yours, if you're not there. But if you're there, it's all bets are off. But, yeah. Uh, that's, yeah, that's my opinion on Sunday school is I 100% want the kids to do with us. And I only mention the Catholic not having Sunday school to say that like, we're not that weird, like, there's other people doing what we're doing. And I also we also visited a church in, mm -hmm. where they have a room that's next to the chapel. Yes. So you can be in the service without being yeah, in Yeah, they had a, um, uh, so yeah, I liked that. Stuff like that's yeah. done. It's not like, mm -hmm. it's not one size fits all needs. There's other churches doing different things. Yeah. So we're not that crazy. Like, yeah. I don't think so anyways. Yeah. Well, maybe we are, but. <laughs> Okay, was your husband on board with homeschooling? Well, I can answer this question. Yes, because I homeschooled for a while and I, I liked it. 
you know, I couldn't do it. It's not that I wouldn't want to do it. I would try doing it if for some reason some, you know, some happened. I, would, mm -hmm. I wouldn't send them all back to public school. I would yeah. be watching these videos to learn how to do it. <laughs> I'd watch all her videos to learn how to do it. So, but yeah, I was definitely on board. And last one, I'll let you answer. Were we both homeschooled? Well, I guess like we had already yeah. answered this question. So. Yeah, yeah. My, my audience knows this question yes. too. But. She was homeschooled all yeah, K, through K through 12, 12 and yeah. I was homeschooled you know, sixth and seventh, and I went back to school at eight. So I was homeschooled two years. And uh, I think ends up uh, this episode. How do you want to wrap it up? I think that's good. I feel like every single one of these questions we could talk about for like ever. And we did. Yes. So <laughs> if you made it to the end, yeah, please, please, please leave that in the comments. Let us know you made it to the end of this video yeah. because we really appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, and it really helps our channel out. Not really our, it hurts channel out. Our channel. Yeah, our channel. Yeah. And so we appreciate y'all watching and mm -hmm. staying to the end yeah. of these long-winded videos. We do. Even if you're just listening in the background. Your appreciate our appreciation. I listen to most videos equally. on the background. Yeah. All the videos I watch, I have. Most a mothers background. don't have time to sit yeah. down and watch a video for podcast. An hour, that's, so. I think that's why I like podcast style. They're some of my favorite because it's not something I actually have to watch. But things that I actually watch are like the curriculum reviews and things like that. But how hard is it to create a load up podcast onto like Google or I I Spotify Probably or whatever? Not too bad. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for watching, guys. Yeah. Thank you, guys, again. Until my next one, you guys. Bye.